Okay, let's continue our uh, afternoon session. The next speaker is Sam Sanders from <coughs> Munich, I guess. And he will tell us about the unreasonable effectiveness of non standard analysis, not mathematics. <laughs> Well, mathematics too, as you will see, but anyway. Um, as you can see from the title of my talk, I will be discussing the computational or effective content of non-standard analysis. Now, that there be such content, so non-computational or effective content in non-standard analysis is a non-trivial statement, at least if one would ask these luminaries, Alain Kohn, and Eric Bishop, their view was that non-standard analysis has no numerical, constructive, or computable content. Bishop went as far as calling non-standard analysis a debasement of meaning, meaning for him was computational constructive content. Alain Kohn stated in, well, somewhere, I think it was the Mathematical Gazette, once you have one infinitesimal, all the computational content is out of the window. So what is one to do in the face of such adversaries? Well, prove them wrong, obviously. So in this talk, I will try to convince you that non-standard analysis has tons of numerical, constructive, and computable content. And well, that would be metric tons, by the way. So. The technical aim is to show that theorems of pure non-standard analysis um, give rise, produce effective theorems not involving non-standard analysis, and vice versa. So what do I mean by these things? Pure non-standard analysis is, well, non-standard analysis only involving the non-standard definitions of continuity, <coughs> compactness, differentiation, Riemann integration, and so on. Throw the epsilon delta out of the window, and ye shall have computational content. Uh, that's pure non-standard analysis. We'll also see that we can go beyond analysis. That's the third part of the talk. What's an effective theorem? What do you think it is? A theorem from constructive or computable mathematics? Or, if that's impossible, some explicit or effective equivalence from reverse math? So I'll show you some machine where you can throw in a proof of a no pure non-standard analysis theorem. Outcomes, if you're lucky, constructive or computable analysis. Otherwise, some classification from reverse math. Now, what's the vice versa about? So I'll show you non-standard analysis, shake, 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 outfalls constructive math or reverse math. But if you did it correctly, if you do the proof mining, as it's called, well, you can go back. Certain effective theorems, which I christened urbanizations, imply the original non-standard theorem from which they were extracted. So there's uh, somehow equivalent in the meta-theory. Uh, and the motivation for all this is, if you pick up a textbook on non-standard analysis, at some point the author will always say, yeah, I know non-standard analysis, and it's all supposed to be non-constructive and ultra-filters and infinitesimals, but it still feels somehow constructive, effective. The, the praxis, the practice of non-standard analysis is somehow constructive. And this is best formulated by Horst Oswald, Munich's very own, in his notion of local constructivity, about which we will write something in the forthcoming Brouwer volume. So, uh, non-standard analysis 101, just in case. It all really only started with Abraham Robinson's non-standard analysis in 1965. And essentially what it amounts to is a semantic approach for a given structure M, say the real numbers. One uses a free ultra filter to build a non-standard model. If you're a constructivist, you can use a weaker filter and build this thing inside Martin Luff type theory, but most of us would just use a free ultra field. So here we have our structure M sitting inside of the non-standard model star M. If M has the natural numbers, then star N, of course, has a set which has the same properties as the natural numbers, but much bigger. And we say that the 
new elements, not in n, are the non-standard numbers. In general, there is what is called a star morphism, which you build using the free ultra filter, uh, which takes any set in m, x, and blows it up to star x in star m. And unless it's finite, it will be much bigger. So x contains the standard objects, star x minus x contains the non-standard objects. And all this is particularly useless. Non-standard models were already known to score them, and you can't really do anything with the non-standard models alone. What makes non-standard analysis tick, and which is Robinson's genius contribution, is how m and star m are related. Non-standard analysis is jumping back and forth between m and star m. If you run into trouble here, you just go to the non-standard world and back after a while. It's how these things are connected. And that's what Robinson's contribution was, the three important properties he proved which connect a structure and its non-standard model. So the first one is the transfer principle. Say we're talking about formulas of ZFC. <coughs> this formula holds in the original structure, if and only if, star phi holds in star m. And star phi just means putting stars in front of all the constants, thus blowing them up. So truth in the small structure is the same as truth in the big structure, four formulas in the original language. Now, there's also what is called the standard part principle, which is sort of the reverse of the star morphism. The star morphism blows up something in the small structure to something big. But ultimately, we're interested in going back to the standard world, to M, because yeah, that's where real math happens. And that's what the standard part principle does. It tells you for any object, there's a standard object, so in M, which has the same standard objects. So for example, for any hyperreal, you can take, which is finite, you can <coughs> take the standard part, which will be an actual real. So uh, the star morphism allows you to go into the non-standard world. The standard part pushes you back. It should not be a surprise that the standard part of star n <coughs> is exactly this n. And then there's idealization and saturation, but we're going to say dot, dot, dot there for now. So this is Robinson's semantic approach. It's very powerful. It has a lot of advantages. There's also, by Nelson, a syntactic approach to non-standard analysis, which deserves to be better known. And it's called internal set theory. So rather than building a model and so on, it's based on yeah, extensions of the language, syntax. So Nelson says, well, let's just take the language of ZFC and add a new predicate. X is standard, STX, unary predicate. We introduce two new quantifiers. There is a standard and for all standard, which means exactly that there is a standard and for all standard objects. The formula is called internal if it does not contain the new predicate ST and external otherwise. And it's on only internal formulas can be used to form sets. That's why it's called internal set theory. Internal set theory is just IST, is just ZFC, which is an internal. ZFC is just our internal formula. And three new axioms, I, S, and T, idealization, standard part, and transfer. So Robinson had these as theorems, and Nelson just adopts these as axioms. Transfer just says, well, if something is true for the standard world, it's true everywhere, with some conditions. Standard part is standard part. And idealization essentially tells you, well, you can push the standard quantifiers to the front of the formula. It's just a bookkeeping device. Um, that's very, it's just very useful. Transfer is about as non-constructive as the original sin, the law of excluded middle. Standard part can be salvaged, and idealization, as I said, is just a bookkeeping device. So ZFC and IST prove the same internal sentences. IST, of course, proves them a little faster on average, but ultimately it's just that, a conservative extension for the original language of ZFC. So this is IST, and we can prove similar uh, conservation results for fragments of IST. And 
I'll, we'll be looking at a fragment of IST based on Gödel's T. So this is the paper, Benno van den Berg, Evin Brisset, and Pavel Safarik. They looked at uh, Gödel's system T, which is just primitive recursion, which you all know, in all finite types. So PRA, uh, Hilbert's finitism, whatever, just has primitive recursion for functions. This has system T has primitive recursion for all finite types. Um, usually the system is named EPA omega, piano arithmetic in all finite types with the axiom of extensionality. So as I said, we can have idealization. It's a bookkeeping device. So we can have a version of standard part, but we have to lobotomize it a little. Uh, this is called Urbrandeis axiom of choice. So here you see your typical axiom of choice kind of stuff. For all standard, there is a standard, then there's a choice functional. But the choice functional is rather stupid. It does not provide a witness to Y. It provides a finite sequence of witnesses. Of course, if we want a conservative extension of piano arithmetic, we have to somehow uh, make standard part weaker, or the axiom of choice. So this is how it's weakened. F does not provide a witness, but a finite sequence of witnesses, as you can see here. No transfer, as I said, is the original sin of uh, non-constructive stuff. And the system P, which is Gödel's T plus non-standard stuff, is a conservative extension. And we could do the same thing for HA omega and intuitionistic logic. It's all the same. So, so far, I've hopefully only told you stuff you know. There's Robinson's non-standard analysis, there's Nelson's syntactic approach, and we can do something similar for uh, fragments. Now comes the new stuff, a new computational aspect of <coughs> non-standard analysis. There's two words you have to remember, term extraction, as follows. So again, in this paper, it's somewhat hidden, but you can bring it out if you read the paper. If system P proves for all standard there is a standard, from this proof we can extract a term such that the system proves for all there exists and that there exists is witnessed by T, where T is again this Urbrand witness, a finite sequence of witnesses. And this should be compared to the to another work of art by Gödel, the Gödel Jensen or Friedman translation for pi zero two formulas. So, if piano arithmetic proves some pi zero two formula, so using classical logic, then from this proof. One can extract a term such that HA omega proves for all n uh, phi n t n. So even though classical math is classical, we can still get computational information about pi zero two formulas. So for all numbers, there is a number. Now, what is different here, and uh, which is essential, is that this is just these are pi zero two formulas, which is a very small class of the edifice of mathematics. However, this kind of formulas is actually a very large class. First of all, one observes that the usual non-standard definitions, continuity, compactness, Riemann integration all can be brought into this normal form for all standard, there is a standard. And secondly, these normal forms are closed under modus ponens. So any theorem of pure non-standard analysis can be proof mined using this kind of uh, term extraction result. So this is the fundamental difference. Here we have pi zero two, a very small class, but if we but into non-standard analysis, this kind of class
class of theorems we can study is very large, namely all of pure non-standard analysis, for which there can be term extraction. So non-standard analysis is very non-standard in that sense. It has a huge class of theorems, which may be proof mind, if you like. Whereas here, yeah, there's more of a restriction. Of course, non-standard analysis, she is cheating, because she has a much richer language. Ah, so um, theorems of non-standard analysis formulated only with the non-standard definitions of continuity, compactness, and so on. You know from calc 1 to 5, the epsilon delta definitions, there's also the corresponding non-standard definitions, which have less quantifiers in them. And those definitions have this sort of normal form, Yeah, whereas the epsilon delta do not, of course. I'll show you examples now. <laughs> so here, for example, we have non-standard uniform continuity on the unit interval, which, well, no, not many quantifiers. For every x and y, if x and y are infinitely close, then their images are infinitely close. That's non-standard uniform continuity. And if for a function f we can prove this in p, from this proof we can extract a term t, from Gödel's t, so primitive recursive, such so that EPA omega proves the usual epsilon delta definition with a twist, uh, and vice versa. If EPA proves 2, then P also proves non-standard continuity. So 2 is the notion of continuity, where t is called a modulus from constructive and computable math. So normally we have, for all epsilon, there's a delta. Our t is kind enough to compute this delta for us. So from a proof of non-standard uniform continuity, we get a modulus of non-standard uniform continuity. And so from if we stand in the meta theory, constructive con con continuity or non-standard continuity is just the same thing. So we're doing it right. Et pour les constructivistes, la même chose. You can also do this in, in this heighting arithmetic and all that, but you guys being set theorists and all may not care so much for that. I'm still going to mention it every time. <laughs> so now let's look at a real theorem, which you all know from Calc 1. Continuity implies Riemann integration. So here we have the <coughs> non-standard version. Non-standard continuity implies non-standard Riemann integration. So we need some notation, of course. So these pi things, they're partitions of the unit interval. So 0, x0, t0, t1, uh, x1, and so on, until xn, n1. Uh, so this is a partition of the unit interval. They have infinitesimal mesh. So this pi is the maximum for i below n of the distance between xi and xi minus 1. So the distance between two partition points. So it has to be infinitesimal, so the partition is infinitesimally fine or infinitely fine. And s pi of f is just the Riemann sum, which is just i from uh, 0 to n, f of ti <laughs> xi minus xi minus 1. So this is all stuff you might remember in the back of your mind. So if our partition is infinitely fine, the Riemann sums will be infinitely close, of course, to the real Riemann integral. Now, so assuming we can prove this in p, well, actually, you can prove this in p. We can extract the term s2, so of type 2, so that's for any function f and any modulus g, if g is a modulus of continuity, sg is a modulus of Riemann integration. And this is exactly what the constructivists and the computabilists do. A modulus of continuity is transformed by this explicit term s into a modulus of Riemann integration. 
This is, if you read Bishop's book, this is exactly what they do in constructive and computable analysis. So from a proof that something non-standard uniformly continuous is non-standard Riemann integral, from this proof you can read off this term S. Every step in the proof is a subterm of S, and at the end you just pile them together. So this can be really read off. And I have a postdoc who is computerizing that process. And you can do the same thing in intuitionistic blah. Now, what happens if we don't have, if we take something that's known to be non-constructive, such as reverse math? I take it you at least have heard of reverse math, uh, pioneered by Harvey Friedman, 75. They would prove stuff like the following. RCA is zero, which is, yeah, say, computable math. Proves some nice equivalence. So you have um, ACA zero, which is sort of, yeah, the Turing jump exists. Is equivalent to the monotone convergence theorem. Every monotone sequence in the unit interval converges. And it's called reverse math because this is the usual way of doing math from axioms to theorems. And you can also prove the reverse, reverse math. And so this is, this is the first uh, equivalence in Steve Simpson's book on reverse math. And you can prove a non-standard version thereof. So <coughs> a fragment of the transfer principle, namely for pi zero one or sigma zero one formulas, can be proved to be equivalent to the fact that every standard monotone sequence non-standard converges. As I said, we're interested in pure non-standard analysis, so no epsilon delta. And so a sequence xn non-standard converges to x, if and only if. For every n, if n is non-standard, then xn is infinitely close to x. So non-standard convergence, usually you take the limit for n going to infinity. In non-standard analysis, we have infinity, namely the non-standard numbers. We just plug it in, and it's supposed to be infinitely close. So here we have some reverse math equivalence. Nobody would care, because nobody likes non-standard analysis usually. But then you do the proof mining, and you get two terms, u and v, such that if chi is the Turing jump functional, then u of chi computes the rate of convergence of any monotone sequence. Vice versa, if psi computes the rate of convergence of any monotone sequence, then v of psi is the Turing jump. So this is the explicit equivalence, ac0 is equivalent to the monotone convergence theorem. So normally, you prove non-effective equivalences in reverse math. ACA0 just says, yeah, the Turing jump exists. And the monotone convergence theorem says, yeah, this or that converges. From the non-standard thing, you can actually extract all these uh, effective results. Namely, expressing the Turing jump in terms of a realizer for MCT and vice versa. Ah, yeah, you can do it constructively, too. So now to convince you that um, it's not just about analysis, we'll look at an example from group theory. So uh, one of the stronger systems in uh, reverse math is pi 1, 1 comprehension. And this is equivalent to some theorem of group theory, which says that every countable abelian group is the sum of a reduced and a divisible group. The non-standard version of this equivalence is as follows. Instead of pi 1, 1 comprehension, we have pi 1, 1 transfer. And it's equivalent to every standard countable abelian group is the direct sum of a standard divisible group and a standard reduced group. From this rather, for my standards, strong statement, we can extract the following things. If chi is the Suslin functional, then u of chi computes this direct sum. And if psi computes this direct sum, then v of psi is the Suslin functional. 
where the Suslin functional is a realizer for the Taiwan 1 comprehension scheme, more or less. <coughs> and this is again one of these explicit equivalences. So who would have thought, like if we only had done our reverse math in non-standard analysis, a computer could just extract all the effective content. But alas, we did not. Compactness is a particularly pretty animal, by the way. Um, so a space is non-standard compact if and only if for any point there is a standard point infinitesimally close by. And for example, you could prove that the unit interval is non-standard compact if and only if every non-standard continuous function is non-standard Riemann integrable. Uh, so, and this is not uniform continuity, this is usual continuity. And you can extract terms such that if omega is the fan functional, then u omega computes the Riemann integral, and vice versa, if it computes the Riemann integral, then you can compute the fan functional. The fan functional is a realizer for the fan theorem, which is the classical contraposition of WKL. And so, yeah, explicit reverse math for all. However, compactness has multiple non-equivalent normal forms. Recall that a normal form has the form for all standard there is a standard. Uh, and one of these normal forms, let's call it p-compactness, is the space can be discretely divided into infinitesimal pieces. This is exactly what physicists and engineers do when they trot out the infinitesimal calculus. You can't let a physicist near a compact space or he or she will try to divide it into infinitesimal pieces. That's what they do. And so this is p-compactness. And for example, if we have a p-compact set, then the image is also p-compact if f is non-standard uniform continuous. Now, if we run this through the proof mining apparatus, we get the following, which is very ugly, because it's a theorem of constructive math. If psi witnesses the totally boundedness of x and g is a modulus of uniform continuity, then u psi g witnesses that the image is totally bounded. Now, what's totally bounded? It's the preferred notion of compactness in constructive and computable math. So let us get this straight. From the preferred notion of compactness, p-compactness, what the physicist might use, out falls the totally boundedness, the notion of constructive and computable math you would almost start believing that there's some independent reality which we're discovering because it's so beautiful. Which I do. Right, so a technical conclusion, and I don't think we're going to get much further. Chair permitting. Yeah. Um, so non-standard analysis is unreasonably effective as follows. <coughs> Look at pure non-standard analysis, where pure means use the non-standard definitions, not epsilon delta, the non-standard definitions of everything. Term extraction works for the huge class of four theorems of pure non-standard analysis. Every theorem of pure non-standard analysis has this normal form, and we have this term extraction property, this, this urbrand uh, ter witnesses. So it would seem that Kahn and Bishop were wrong, to say the least. And can I have one more slide? So, um, I have, oh, maybe two. Uh, <laughs> urbanizations. So, what we've seen so far is that take proof in pure non standard analysis, run it through the Vandenberg et al. machine, you get constructive math or construct, uh, effective reverse math. We can do better than that, actually. So, here we are again with uh, uh, non standard continuity implies non standard Riemann integration. If you try but a little harder, you can extract two terms, i and o, and they do the following. So what is that? So intuitively speaking, if we want to compute the Riemann integral up to precision epsilon prime, we need to know that f is continuous as witnessed by g up to this precision. The so normal mathematics says, well, continuity implies Riemann integration. This thing, number five, says a little bit of continuity implies a little bit of Riemann integration. It's a pointwise version. And it's, in fact, a theorem of numerical analysis, called the, which I call the urbanization. And it's equivalent to the non-standard version in the meta-theory. 
So from the proof of this non-standard thing, you can extract these terms. And if we have a proof of number 5, we can manipulate that into a proof of number 4, all very algorithmically. So non-standard analysis not only has some uh, constructive content which we can mine, we can prove that in the meta theory it's equivalent to some theorem yeah, of numerical analysis or vaguely reminiscent of that. And every theorem of pure non-standard analysis has such a meta-equivalent urbanization involving lots and lots of uh, yeah, up to precision this, up to precision that. So that is quite something. So theorems of non-standard analysis believed to be totally non-constructive are in fact meta-equivalent to say numerical analysis type of stuff. I therefore claim the moniker the unreasonable effectiveness is not so unreasonable. Uh, then Cambridge's very own the Gandhi Highland functional named after Robin Gandhi and Professor Highland. So it's defined in terms of itself which is very bad mathematics you would think but it still makes sense. So what do I mean by that? Gamma takes as input a type 2 object so which y takes as input a sequence so and the sequence is s followed by 0 and another sequence and it's defined in terms of itself because gamma is defined in terms of gamma so gamma at y and s is defined in terms of gamma at y and successors of s so we can apply this definition again so well uh, gamma of s n plus 1 is this but again there is gamma in olive green and so on and so forth so we can keep applying this definition and this seems to be a non-terminating recursion or if you want non-well-founded non self-reference call the philosophers self-reference now they don't care about this by the way the liar sentence is perfectly fine but this is totally ignored unfortunately anyway gamma is not primitive recursive in the sense of Gödel's t and this g is primitive recursive and it approximates gamma so we can do the um, it does the usual Gandhi Highland functional thing, but the self-reference is gone after m steps. This is called a stopping condition. You can only apply the recursion m times before you go default to the first one. And of course, for non-standard m, g equals gamma. So gamma is not primitive recursive, but g is, and well, you, they're equal if m is non-standard. Now, and you can do this if you add some non-standard continuity because it's actually bar recursive. From this non-standard, again, nobody cares about this non-standard stuff until you show them that from this non-standard stuff you can extract a term computing gamma in terms of the fan functional and some continuity stuff. So, from non-standard analysis, claimed by Kohn and Bishop to be very non-constructive, we can get recursion theory or computability theory which is totally neat uh, yes and finally and then I promise I'll shut up um, the partial computable functions are a central object of study in computability theory in Soros book there's an entire motivation why we should go partial and of course good old system T is total so is Martin Loew type theory and this non-standard system P because well yeah, non-standard analysis and partial objects is dangerous however non-standard analysis can simulate partiality so everything is total in non-standard analysis and this partial system as uh, is system P but we have the following definition if we have the eth computer, computable function it's called standard total if for every standard input it holds after a standard number of steps and standard partial otherwise there are total but standard partial phi e with standard index e so in system t or in p or in martin Lewis type theory everything is total so we can only look at total recursive functions but there are standard partial ones so we can mimic partiality in a standard world again this is people would say yeah but what is it good for actually they have and 
Actually, if you, the previous results on the Gandhi Highland functional, you can sharpen considerably if you use this apparatus. So you, you, you talk about associates rather than type 2 functionals. And these associates can be standard partial. They're all total, but standard partial. And then the previous results get sharpened, and um, it's all wonderful. But I've taken it up more of my time than I should have. So uh, vagueness, we shall skip. Ah, yes, this will not replace any of the existing fields. This will not replace constructive computable math proof mining. It will just unify them. I'm not here to take your job. I just want to make it more interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. And of course, good good will have to be good. Uh, luckily, we had a long break now, so. <laughs> uh, you don't say. Any questions? Yes. Um, I have a question regarding uh, Nelson's uh, point of view. So uh, he, he was a. Uh, he was a not only a constructivist, he was a finitist. And yes. He developed some kind of approach to a radical finitist uh, probability theory. Where he, I think he also used non-standard. Mm -hmm. ISD, exactly. And so my, my question, the, the, the first question is, how did he, um, well, did he realize that there's some comput computational content there? And the second question is, when it comes to con, um, I think he developed his own way of doing non-standard analysis. Could, could you say a little bit how this relates to what you're doing? Yes. Um, so Nelson, um, so uh, Nelson's um, had this, yeah, N Nelson had some strange views on that. And he developed this radical elementary probability theory. I don't think he was so interested in the, in, he would not be interested in this. Because to make this tick, you need the exponential function, essentially. Because these Urbrand witnesses, they're finite sequences. To nicely code finite sequences, you need the exponential function. So I don't think Nelson would have cared about this, because it's not, yeah, the exponential function was inconsistent, according to Nelson. I think he was aware of this somehow, because he does hint at this in his publications about radically elementary probability theory. So one of the one of my plans is to there's some books on this to see what's the yeah uh, what content can be mined from uh, Nelson's probability theory. Um, I don't think Nelson uh, he, he didn't he never responded to my emails. Of course he was dying. Um, I don't think he cared really because it's not it's it has to be sub exponential or it's not true. That, that's that were his views. Um, so he was a very strong finitist. Um, Kohn had, uh, he indeed developed his own uh, view, I mean his own version of non-standard analysis. Um, what's going on here, ah yes, we can, there's actually a nice example. So with the Gandhi Highland functional, uh, this G <coughs> is independent of the choice of non-standard number. This G equals gamma for any non-standard n. And that's sort of the non-standard notion of computability. If we can define something non-standard using non-standard numbers, but independent of the choice of number, like this g, it corresponds to a standard object. I call it omega invariant. Kohn had this thing with traces and whatnot, and ultimately, one could somehow construct or compute something in his formalism if it was independent <coughs> of the particular choice of trace, if I recall correctly. So there, there is some correspondence there, I take it. But Kohn's approach is equally constructive or non-constructive as usual non-standard analysis. <coughs> Canovey et al. And, and Katz have looked at this in, in very minute detail, actually. So there's a huge paper on the archive and published somewhere. So I'm. I'm I'm just going to defer to that. OK. Uh, any more questions, comments? Not less thanks to speaker. Again.